tell me when it will be visible. Visible. Yep, great. So we can start. So we will talk about code generation. Why, how, why will you need it or not? What's the good points, bad points? Like, let's look at our agenda. So first of all, we will look at some brief overview, how I started with code generation, some reasons why you would want to generate code. We will see some live demo of almost all things discussed before. Uh, reasons not to generate code, uh, some types of generation and some small tips and tricks that will help you. So maybe let's begin with like overview and like what is code generation in general? So it's basically anything that you do uh, for generating the code. And like, I want to specify that like today we will going to talk about like things that are mainly focused on code generation and not like some data generation or something like that. Of course, like it's completely different and cool topic to discuss, but not today. And like how I actually got into code generation, um, it's all started like a year ago when I wanted to create my own library for Telegram bots, because uh, uh, all existing libraries were dependent on a lot of interfaces, not full implementation and something like that. Um, just because Telegram doesn't have like structured uh, documentation and reference of their APIs. So I decided why not to generate code for it? And uh, it begins there. So, and we will look at that later. And first, like, let's look at uh, why you would want to generate code. And one of the most obvious reasons is to uh, generate uh, generic com containers and uh, algorithms, for example, sorting, uh, search, something like that, or like generic list, stack, uh, QE, deck, uh, et cetera. So there is a lot of things that you can do. And we are talking about go before 1.18 because generics were introduced there. And like a lot of projects uses like older versions. So you might consider generating code for your types. Another reason is tests. Uh, I think you just like didn't uh, thought about that, but actually when you're uh, using Golend, for example, and you're clicking uh, on a function, right, right button and generate, and then gen test for function, you're actually generating code, your AD does that. And uh, it's actually context aware because like, for example, you can see here we have like, uh, some arguments, some outputs, and it already knows that, like, for example, second arc returning value is error, and it's like pretty common pattern in Go. So it knows that, like, you would want to have a Boolean, like, want error. And you also need to, like, specify your test cases, but everything else is done for you automatically. And there is also, like, a tool called uh, Go Tests which is does which does like uh, almost the same thing but uh, like uh, yeah, out of the land another reason is smokes uh, not sure if all of you are familiar with smokes but generally speaking if you have some logic and you want to separate it into another interface and to test it uh, you would want to implement some kind of thing that will uh, uh, represent your execution of code inside of interface and uh, it called mocks and you can does, uh, do that yourself and like a lot of uh, test frameworks uh, provide you some helpful things but uh, the most useful for me uh, and maybe for most of us are code generation because you're just specifying your interface and the command to generate uh, mocks from the interface right away and you get all like cool features uh, without doing nothing. Uh, another thing uh, is bindings and tools. Uh, so it's kind of strange category because like, what is it? Uh, but let's uh, look. Uh, one of it is gRPC. Uh, as you may know, gRPC uses proto buffers and uh, it's a binary format. So uh, you need some kind of serializer and deserializer to perform your uh, use of proto buffers and sending data with gRPC. 
And actually, when you're using gRPC, it generates your code for you. So you get like a server and client, which is automatically parses all your data. Another thing is uh, Swagger. Uh, there is a lot of tools for generating both clients and servers uh, from Swagger file. And uh, like it's really useful when you're creating some uh, proof of concept uh, or you need just like really quickly create something uh, that will work. Uh, and like it also may have like a lot of features like uh, authorization, middleware, and something like that. Uh, another one is Telego. It's actually my library that I wrote for Telegram bots. It uh, implements like fully one-to-one -one Telegram uh, bot API with all types and all methods. And they're all generated from Telegram documentation, which uh, as I will show you later, doesn't have like structured reference or something like that. Uh, it's just plain HTML. Uh, one more thing is, uh, for example, Wayland bindings uh, for Go. Uh, and actually, uh, this library was generated from Wayland specification that is described in XML file. So they basically generated whole library uh, from one XML file, which specifies how Wayland works. And once it's like small useful thing uh, is Stringer that we will look at. It's a tool for uh, generating uh, uh, string uh, method for your enum types. Uh, and we will also look at it. And uh, two small places where you can look at some cool stuff that are generated is uh, uh, starts for web framework. Uh, and uh, there is like a list of uh, repositories that are uh, with like template uh, code for starting uh, your web framework and I know that some of them are using uh, generation for help you start your project, like uh, generating uh, models and types and something like that from, for example, from your database. And another place where you can look for generators and tools is uh, at Go Awesome repo. They have also tech generators there, so you can check and look that there. Uh, one more reason is embedding files. And we are talking about Go before 1.16, where Go Embed was actually introduced. Uh, so uh, previously, before Go Embed, uh, for example, if you want to introduce some config file uh, inside your binary or some assets for game development or whatever you want, uh, you would need to use some external tool, uh, like, for example, file to buy flies which will actually generate a Go file with variable, and that variable contains byte slice of your actual file content. And before one Go 1.16, you actually don't need that, so use that if, if uh, you're using later version of Go, and we will look at this example too. And last uh, but not least, uh, it's esoteric reason. Uh, and there is actually a lot of things that you can do with code generation just for fun. And Quine is uh, one of it. And uh, it's actually, uh, Quine is like esoteric program that uh, just uh, uh, prints its uh, source code uh, without using uh, anything like a reading file or something like that. So it's uh, system agnostic and like you can uh, generate code from itself. And uh, one thing that we'll briefly look, it's Quine Relay. Uh, and it's basically a Quine that generates a new language each time. And it does it in 128 languages and it does it in a loop. And Go is also one of the languages that are used there. So, okay, let's start with uh, small demos. Uh, so this, these two demos are actually on GitHub. So we can check that later if you want. Let's first start from general demo and we can go like with tests first. So imagine you have some function that has some return times, increments. You go inside your ID and go to test generate and test for function. You can also generate for file, package, etc. And basically, yeah, 
uh, as I showed before, it generated all this code uh, from just known function signature, and uh, it may be really useful for you if you're creating tests for that. And uh, I think like most of you didn't thought about that, but it's actually a code generation. Okay, let's continue. So for example, imagine you have a Swagger file with some of your projects. Uh, I just took uh, the default uh, example Swagger from editor.swagger.io. Uh, it's a pet store, basically. So it has some requests with some authentication and something like that. And we can like try its first uh, generate server for that. It will take some time. Okay. And basically, as you can see, just from Swagger file, we already have server uh, configured with all of our models, API requests, responses, uh, like with our structs, for example, pet. And also we have uh like some configuration files some documentation also for swagger uh, or server implementation so, and all sorts of cool things that we can like, configure uh, and it's all basically for free like, for one click of the button we can also generate a client for that exact server which will also use uh, uh, models and like other configuration and as you can see we have like pretty full client with uh, routes configuration uh, and other things all of that like, models here we can see like you have like, for users creating users deleting users login something like that and it's all generated from soccer file there's a lot of like generators from Swagger, so you can choose what whatever uh, fits you the most. Then, like for example, imagine uh, most common pattern in Go for enums is using IOTA, and uh, like it's really useful and simple to use, but still you don't have like uh, user-friendly outputs of those fields. So uh, there's a tool called Stringer, uh, and you just specify what, sh what type you would want to generate a string for that. And as you can see, it took names of uh, the our and of our num and just placed it into a string. And when you call string, it returns a uh, like specific value that you need. And by the way, it also checks uh, like for redefinitions. So every time you generate it uh, it uh, makes like compile time check for your strikes that like if you didn't if you change something it will fail in completion and it will remind you that you need to regenerate that code uh, next thing is mocks uh, imagine you have some interface uh, with some methods uh, and you want to test it you just specify go uh, go mockgen command, and from that interface, it will automatically generate all stuff for you. Uh, here we have function generate. That means that like we are implementing that exact interface, and it has exact expects function, and we can pass like expected arguments. Uh, what is the output of the function, and all sorts of things uh, that are like embedded in that library. You can use it and uh, it's pretty simple and like fast to develop this because it's generated right away. Mm. Another example is gRPC. Imagine you have like really simple or not simple uh, service. Like it has one method, uh, one request, one response. Yep. And we want to generate server for that. We call in protoc. Uh, command with some arguments for uh, generating Go code. Yep. And we basically got uh, our uh, code generated for GPC ready to use. We have like our uh, response uh, request, and it already has like some serialization and deserialization data because like as you remember protobufs are bi binary formats 
and also we have like already uh, <coughs> server generated for it so we, we uh, for us we just need to uh, implement server interface that will return response accept request and we can use it and for client we just creating new client with new grpc connection we and we can right now use it with uh, our request and it's also generated uh, things that we talked about it's uh, embedding files and let's let's first look at like how we doing that with uh, a go embed right now so we just specifying go embed uh, side effects imports and we are specifying the file name. Uh, and uh, in right runtime, uh, this variable will have content of that file. You can specify here string or just the by slice, whatever you want. Also, you can use uh, like dear the slash star, and this can be uh, embed fs, which will actually give you uh full file system support uh, and you can like see your embedded files and use it uh, as regular file system uh, and the thing is that like before going bad we should have uh, like such thing as uh, code generators which will generate like actually a file with content of your uh, desired file let's run it and as you can see, we generated some file. It has our variable and it has the content of the file that we wanted, which is the same. And this, those generators basically work the same, but difference uh, in interface. And one thing that I want to talk about, it's uh, about library EasyJSON, which is not maintained. Uh, that's why I didn't put that in the presentation, but still. You can find some uh, alternatives to it which are maintained uh, and basically what what it does it is actually generating uh, json uh, marshallers and unmarshallers for your structs uh, without using reflection and like as you can see it has already generated code for uh, fast and like really performant generation of uh, json uh, the reason why those uh, libraries are really useful is uh, when you're basically creating uh, new types with uh, JSON tag. Uh, in Go, there is no way except using reflection for uh, marshaling and then marshaling JSON. Uh, yep, there there is there are some libraries which will be faster or slower. But at the end of the day, you have only two ways of of marshaling JSON. It's code generation or use of reflection. And code generation generally are uh, more performant. OK, so let's then maybe look at uh, some example of implementation of uh, generated containers and like difference between generic and generated code. Uh, we will look at like simple uh, stack implementation uh, and as you can see from user perspective like when we are creating two different stacks uh, their uh, user <coughs> like user API uh, it's completely the same you you can tell the difference between them uh, the difference is only when you're creating them actually uh, and maybe let's look first at generic version and then it will be like more clear why it is really useful to use generics and like why it's really easy to generate uh, generic containers. Uh, so our stack, it's uh, a container just and it doesn't depend on like underlying type. And that's why we are just specifying type parameter as any and we are using it uh almost everywhere just as like return parameter or uh our uh, receiver type and let's look then at uh, our generated code so as you can see it's like almost the same except uh instead of using type parameter we are using concrete type with concrete name and basically that's it 
and those implementations are like pretty similar and like doesn't look uh, that much different. And the reason why, uh, because I used the uh, uh, generic version of this algorithm uh, to generate uh, our stack implementation for int, for example. And uh, Go has like really powerful and cool tool to use uh, templates. Uh, and they fit perfectly for this task because like you can specify like package name, imports, and especially like uh, uh, name of type you want to specify. And actually you can see that our stack type uh, only dependent on exact type and the specific implementation doesn't care about uh, like what we are generating for. And like we can like have an example for, for example, for string, I'm just calling uh, <clears throat> our generator, which is uh, by the way, also in here. And it also has main folder, uh, main function, sorry, uh, which just parses uh, CLI arguments, uh, parses templates, fills the file, and then formats is with going forwards. Uh, and uh, the reason why I can't do that is because like I have included uh, go build stack here, which is really useful if you're uh, keeping your generator right, uh, in, right inside your code. So let's imagine we want to generate a stack for string. Uh, we just need to specify like what type it will be and like names as a tribe. And we can go generate. Reload. Why well, doesn't want to reload again? Oh, now it worked. Golan doesn't want to change files very often. <laughs> Reload, sorry, then. And as you can see, uh, here we have like stack for string. And uh, the only difference is that it uses word string instead of integer int. So it's really easy to generate such code. And like in case if you don't have generics available for you, uh, you can go with that. And uh, let's then go to Quine. So this is actually a source code uh, of the program that generates its codes. And as you can see, it's like pretty small. The string is not really long. And like, le let's look at what it can do. So let's run it. And as you can see, it just generated Go code. And like, for example, let's put it into file. So we have a new file and as you can see, it has like the same content. Like, let, let's prove that by using that generated file and generate new file, new source code from source code and actually check the difference like between like first main file and like generated twice code. And diff command shows that it returns with status zero. That means that like the code is uh, completely the same. So as you can see, like all three of those files have same code. And last demo that I will show you is actually a Telegram bot that uh, library that I've built. And like before that, like let's look how uh, Telegram API actually looks. Uh, so their documentation. So basically they have like list of methods and all methods have like name, parameters, types, uh, are they required and description for users. And that's basically it. And as far as I know, there is no official uh, reference API with some structured content apart of this one. So most of the libraries that are uh, creating Telegram bots uh, are using like a lot of uh, interfaces and has not all implementation of Telegram API library, just because there are a lot of methods 
and actually types that you need to implement yourself uh, if you're not using code generation. And uh, when I started to create this library, I actually uh, thought, why not just read that uh, HTML file and parse it with regular questions and just generate code from it and actually have like all types and methods and parameters that Telegram has and actually like uh, methods has uh, 3000 lines of code and uh, types has 4000 lines of code and actual generated files that like my, li uh, my library is generating like you can see uh, as content of it and it's just plain goat code that has all comments, all types, uh, all, all parameters of Telegram and it implements like fully one-to-one -one implementation of Telegram bot API and I have generators for types, for methods, uh, for their tests, also for some helper function for uh, methods, for types and all sorts of things uh, and also, by the way, like uh, for tip for you when you're generating code and like, for example, here I'm generating a lot of methods and basically we need to have tests for them. Uh, and I'm also generating tests for them. So <laughs> that's not like something new because uh, as I remember, there is like 80 or something like that methods. So there will be a nightmare to implement tests for all of them. So I just generated them and the tip that I wanted to advise you is when you're generating code and also test for it, uh, remember that uh, when you generated code, feel to try to test it with your existing tests uh, and only after that uh, generate new tests for that code. So it will really help you and it helped me like quite sometimes a lot. And that's it basically for our demos. Uh, small, like one thing that uh, remember that Quine Relay, uh, that code that generates uh, 128 languages, uh, its source code looks like this. And uh, also uh, actually generated uh, this source code from image and from code both. So we can do all sorts of fun things uh, doing that with code generation, not just like for work. Okay, let's continue with our presentation. Uh, let's talk about some like bad things about code generation and why you would want to avoid it actually. And first one is reflection and or unsafe. Uh, actually, when you're generating code, you're uh, going, uh, you're trying to get rid of it basically because uh, uh, code generation generally helps you to reduce things that you uh, need to know at runtime. And it's uh, like good practice when you want to have performant code, uh, which, can, which can be implemented in both uh, generation and uh, reflection, but reflection is generally uh, slower quite, some, uh, quite a bit. And you need to remember that when you're struggling, actually, you might need to use generics. Uh, because uh, in most of the cases, when it's possible to use uh, reflection or code generation, uh, it's also possible to use generics. Uh, for example, for uh, containers or some generic algorithms, uh, you can use uh, both code generation, reflection, and actually generics to do them. Uh, but uh, all of them, apart from generics, will be uh, less readable for users. Uh, and uh, you can think about like what suits you the best. Because if you want like the most performance, use code generation. If you don't have generics, uh, you may use uh, reflection. Uh, but then you have like uh, unsafe uh, type assertions all over the place. And if you have generics, but doesn't carry it like blazingly fast performance, you can use generics. But still, you should remember that 
for example, uh, generic sorting for uh, default Golang types like strings, integers are actually faster than using the sort function with interface or less function. So you should also consider that. Also, imagine the situation. You generated some types, you generated some methods, uh, and you're pushing that to production. What will happen? Yep, exactly. You just generated a lot of code and you have 2% coverage, for example. So uh, it's a tricky question, should you test generated code or no? Uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, code is code, and even if it's generated, you should test it. But for things like mocks, uh, you probably don't want to do that because like testing tests, it's not like really good thing actually. Uh, but still you need like to consider uh, what you are doing and like, uh, is it feasible for you to write tests for your generated code or no? And like, if it's critical, should, uh, should those tests be generated or you should write them manually? So there is like a lot of things that you may want to discuss uh, on that. And uh, another thing is uh, it's hard to change code for specific uh, use cases. For example, imagine you have uh, some generator, for, for example, for some container, and you want it to behave differently for different types. Um, and the thing is uh, that uh, you actually need to do changes in code generator itself uh, and not a generated code. Uh, in, uh, and actually code generation is like, fully supported by Go and welcomed by the community and like, official Go command uh, has comment on that, that uh, every generated file should have such directives that says like go, go generated by something and do not edit. So this thing is like really important and uh, like a lot of editors uh, are treat this thing uh, and for example, in Goland, uh, it says at the top that this file was generated and uh, do not edit it. And the reason why is uh, because uh, every time you regenerate your code, uh, you will basically lose all your changes and uh, there is no point of changing that. So you will end up with changing your code generator and have something like that. And uh, like creating code generators are like sometimes pretty tricky because of such uh, messy stuff, which are really dependent on which type you're using for generating code. Let's uh, then see like uh, from what you can generate code. It's like a small list, but still. Um, first of all, you can generate code from structured content. If you already have some parsed things or you're parsing CLI arguments or something like that, and like keep in mind that like JSON or YAML or any other structured content file can could help you with that. Like even when you're creating generators that uses uh, uh, HTML, like plain HTML, you can use uh, that as structured content and like not rely on regular expressions, but actually rely on uh, HTML text for that. Another thing is that you can generate code from plain text basically. <clears throat> And uh, it may be really powerful uh, if you're trying, like for example, for uh, behavior algorithms, uh, imagine if you described uh, uh, some behavior in some uh, sort of form and you're generating the code that will actually execute your behavior uh, based on what you've typed. And, <clears throat> and it's actually like quite funny because like GitHub Copilot and other A powered code generators are actually generating code from plain text. And uh, it's also like quite uh, fascinating that right now we can do that just from plain text. And you can also uh, imagine doing such things uh, and uh, creating like your designs of uh, strategies to generate code from plain text. And last but not least, it's generating code from code itself. It's basically uh, a structured content, but still 
uh, you can read code uh, just as plain text. You can read code uh, by tokens. You can read code uh, as uh, abstract uh, uh, syntax tree, uh, which is also like exposed to Go developers. You can actually parse your code uh, using uh, uh, tools that are used by the compiler itself. And you can generate code from it. Like for example, tests can be generated easily from code. And uh, also like some uh, extreme uh, code generators can even look at uh, uh, concrete implementation and like look for error handling or something like that and also check that uh, in tests for you. And last, it's uh, small tips and tricks which you can use when generating code. Uh, as you might already seen, uh, I've used uh, all over the places go generate. And it's really good practice to keep your uh, code that like uh, comments to generate your code uh, uh, in your source code because uh, uh, whoever joins your new team or something like that uh, will don't know from where you got that code. And uh, it will really like help uh, both you and newcomers to understand. Uh, and uh, also like remember that code is code as already said and you should uh, format that code uh, you should sort imports uh, for sometimes your generated code should also pass linters uh, like for example in my uh, library my code passes uh, library for telegram bots my code passes linters and like have no warnings for that and also it need to have comments because still e even if it's generated uh, there still might be some people that will read it and uh, it will be really useful to have comments for that. So thanks for your attention and like let's go to the questions, suggestions, anything. We expected that there will be no questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, I really expected that. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I'm interested in about this topic is uh, it's remind us that Go itself used a lot of tooling, and we should be aware about them. And I'm very yep. uh, grateful for Artem that he highlighted this again for us. This topic it's very important to know this tooling and be able to use all of them in terms of it's necessary in your project. Uh, for example, right now I'm working with uh, one of the projects where we're using mock generation, uh, embedded files, I believe. And actually that's uh, distracted me a lot because each build requires a lot of time. So when you need to push something to stage, you need to clean up your project, regenerate everything, grab new translators, mm -hmm. etc. And only after that, you run all tests. And if they pass, you will be able to push to the stage. Yeah. And by the time, someone may do the same. And your push will fail. And you should redone this again and again. So yeah, it may be, become like... Uh, yeah, so. Co co painful, <laughs> really yeah, painful. Maybe but... really painful because of generators itself. And like uh, when I was developing my library, uh, this, I don't want to show you generator because it looks really ugly. Because there is like a lot of cases when you, I am actually checking for specific types, for specific like, use cases, and uh, it may become like nightmare to maintain that actually. <laughs> and like uh, as Ivan already said, yeah before everything you need to regenerate everything and check if it passes and, yep actually i wanted to ask about the types because i mentioned that uh, you have two types int and int 64. Mm, and did you parse it description you the... in your telebot uh, in, in, in your library code. yeah yeah uh yep so actually for that thing uh I don't remember where. Okay, I will just tell you. So for when uh, Telegram has uh, actually in 64, in case if you're using with, with user IDs, chat IDs, and uh, in case if you're using it as Unix timestamp. 
and uh, uh, actually I search in comments so uh, in telegram uh, we are actually have like a lot of such things and mm -hmm. I'm actually searching like for things like 64 bits or unix time and if description of the parameter or type contains such words I am setting it as in 64 and not like in actual But still, okay. there is some, like places yeah. where it and, doesn't. Uh, it's not connected to code, but just a question: Why didn't you use just in sixty four always? Um, because it's really like not user friendly for me to use mm. in sixty four everywhere. Because often you're doing some stuff with your integers uh, inside your code that uh, like doesn't refer to in sixty four. Like for examples. Uh, message out of the time of its Unix time. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but there is like places where it like doesn't matter if it's used uh, in 64 in 32, but like from code, it's easier to you always use int and only if needed uh, using 64. And also by the way, as far as I remember on some architectures, it's faster to use plain int uh, without specifying exactly is it 32 or 64 bits. Okay, thank you. Yep, so, so for example, like we have a cook information, it has max connections. And uh, it's definitely this number can be uh, maxed at in 32, I believe. So there is no need to use in 64 there. Like uh, in a lot of places, it just makes sense to use plain ints. And I also see the comment that it's safe to use uh, 32 bits for all integer. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, actual telegram. Uh, I don't remember where exactly, but it states that explicitly. And for oh, all where type... it was all types, and we have such. Uh -huh. Available types, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's safe to use a uh, 32 bit signed integer for storing integer fields unless otherwise noted. And like in all places where it's noted, uh, we can easily parse that because all of them has like uh, explicitly saying 64 bit or it's Unix time, which is 64 bit or something like that. So it's not like hard to distinguish those places. Actually, and by the way, like when uh, Telegram less, I don't remember. Uh, on some of previous updated, they dropped support for thirty-two bit uh, integer chat IDs and user IDs, and uh, a lot of libraries were crashing on that because uh, uh, their integers were overflowing. And for me, it was a matter of changing, uh, actually not changing anything, but regenerating my code and uh, it will automatically pick up that uh, it has like 64 bit uh, word in uh, its description and it will work. And like by, by way of regenerating library, uh, I've saved me like a lot of time uh, by like when new update games, uh, I just regenerate code, check if it uh, uh, like fill missing places when, when it's needed because still like it's pretty huge library and sometimes you need to do something manually and like writing uh, code for doing one specific manual thing, uh, it's okay, but I thought that it will be easier to fix manually actually. If you need to uh, distinguish like between like uh, a lot of the automation is good and bad, right? something like that. Maybe any other questions? Okay. So if you want to check some links, uh, they all are clickable inside. Uh, uh, our presentation and like 
you can go through this code and check some cool stuff. And also definitely look at those places, uh, especially go awesome. Uh, awesome go, sorry. There are a lot of like really cool uh, projects, not only for generators, actually. And actually the Lego is part of it. But here, yeah, so this is my library for generating. And we have some question. Uh, it's a moment of glory. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Your library in this list. I spent a whole year on it. <laughs> At least someone should know about it. <laughs> yeah, cool. <clears throat> okay.